to Growing Up Ridgefield. I'm Darla Shaw, and I want you to listen to two fascinating people who grew up in Ridgefield and have descendants that go way, way back. And here we have Jim Mullen and his wife, Lynn Cassegrain Mullen, Irish and Italian, a good mix here for Ridgefield. And we're going to start with Jim because we are here in the Peter Parley Schoolhouse. And as far as I know, Jim is the last person in town who had a relative who went to this school. So Jim, why don't you start and tell us about that? Um, yes, my, uh, my father went to school here and all his siblings, uh, my aunts and uncles went here. So uh, this is a picture I have of the, uh, of the class of 1904, maybe later you get a close up of it. But the uh, interesting story on that is that the little girl right in the front is very, very nervous and ashamed because her brother, who was, who was John Mullen, my father, is, taken, is, is having his picture taken with a button missing on his coat. And so she was upset about that. And I think, I think in those days that the, looking back, I'm just guessing at this, that the Irish were sort of uh, an, an immigrant family and immigrants and looked down on them a little bit. As a matter of fact, that there is one story that I was told that my, my grandmother was born and raised in Richfield too. And uh, she, she was walking on Main Street one day and she was spit on and called a dirty Catholic. If you can believe that in Richfield, that's a, that's a sad story. Wow, I hadn't heard that before. Yeah. Very interesting. I just dawned on me this morning yeah. that story. Yeah. And another story about this building is what, what happened to the original bell my father <laughs> My father told me that uh, one Halloween, a message of teenagers were ringing the bell at night, and it came out of the belfry and crashed to the ground, and they took it and threw it over that stone wall, I imagine, right there. Oh, my goodness. And it, some, some junk man got it. And That's quite a story, <laughs> quite a memory, right? Yeah. But well, it, let's go on um, to Lynn now. Now, your history is Italian, goes right. way back, and goes to marketing. Tell us about that. Uh, well, first of all, my both sets of grandparents came over from Italy in the early 1900s. Um, actually, uh, my, an interesting story about my grandmother on my mother's side, their last name was Carini, which I just found out recently that when she came over, it was because her brother was kind of left in charge of her and he wanted to go to Paris. So he stuck her on a boat and sent her off to relatives in New York City. When she got to New York City, she got a job. She was only about 16 or 17 years old, rolling cigars in the Romero Cigar Factory in New York City. And I guess that's where she met my grandfather. Um, and they lived in Waterbury and then they moved to Ridgefield. That was on the Carini, my mother's side. And on my Casagrande side, my grandmother was born in New Orleans, actually, because her family had immigrated, immigrated uh, about three years before she was born to New Orleans. Don't know why, but they did. And she met my grandfather somewhere up north here. And uh, they lived in the house right across from where Gallo's restaurant is right now. Well, I think it's wonderful that you have such strong memories and links, and your family has kept this story going the way they have. That isn't always true. Well, uh, tell me a little bit about your parents. What were their occupations? What did they do in town? What was their educational background? How did they bring you up? Uh, well, first of all, my father was born in Richfield. My grandmother was born in Richfield, and her father, Michael Sullivan, worked for the governor, Phineas T. Lonsbury, I think for 40 years on that estate. And matter of fact, he worked for him before that, that estate house was built. His original 
house was across the street on Governor Street where the VNA is now that they tore that up and stuff. Right. That's where the governor's house was originally. That's where he lived originally. And uh, he was given a watch by the governor right now for 40 years of faithful service. And it's now my, one of my grandnephews has it. And uh, a beautiful a pocket watch with a flip screen on it. And everything. So that's, uh, he was very proud of that. But his name was Michael Sullivan. And uh, that was my grandmother's uh, name. And they, uh, as I said, my father went to school here. But they lived right down the road, maybe a quarter of a mile on the right. And they had a, uh, it was a small farm. It had uh, hay fields and a barn. And uh, one, one great story I remember is that as a kid, my grandmother, oh, my grandfather died before I was born. So I didn't know him, but um, he had bought a, a, a ton of land was, and all that. That's where he put his savings into land. And thank God he did, because uh, my grandmother lived on that, selling off those pieces of land. Oh, it was before Social Security. She had nothing once he died other than that land. Uh -huh. And that's how, they, that's how she survived all those years, selling off chunks of her property. Matter of fact, one piece that she had is Pump Lane. If you're familiar with Pump Lane down yeah. on the way to New York State, down West Lane. He had 11 acres in there of woodland, and that ran back into the, where the Silver Spring now, and that was their pond back there that uh, they used for water to, to irrigate the golf course. And uh, so she, she lived uh, right down the road, as I said, a quarter mile, and, and uh, sold off. Oh, that was one story. <laughs> She had, she had cow fields next to the house down there, big fields, and she had them mowed every <coughs> once a year to keep the hay down. And uh, Mr. Smith, who lived on uh, Silver Spring, and his daughter married Eddie Allen, I think her name was uh, Joan. Joan Smith. Mm -hmm. That was his daughter. He, he had a team of horses. <clears throat> and as a, I remember as a kid, that was a big deal the day he came to move the fields, bringing that team of horses in. Wow. And he had two work horses, and he, he had a sickle bar, he'd cut the hay, and he had a hay rake, he'd rake it. And then we'd pile it up on his wagon, and he'd take it home. And that, that, that wow, was, real farming experience. Yeah. Now, did you have a farming <clears throat> experience your neighborhood? No, or was yours different? Uh, no, no, no farming experience. Um, my grandfather on one side was a mason, um, and uh, my other grandfather worked in a machine machine shop. And of course, the grandmothers were home with their aprons on. The Italian ladies with their aprons, and you never saw them without their aprons. Oh. And uh, cooking, making homemade ravioli, etc. As far as my mother and father go, they both graduated from high school in Richfield. My mother was, I think, for all reports, very smart. She skipped a couple of grades in school. Wow. Would have been a great college student, but of course there was no money, money for that. Uh, as a young woman, she worked in the Elms Inn, along with Elaine Kellerman's mother. They both worked as waitresses in the Elms Inn. And then my mother became the secretary for Judge Donnelly in town. My dad, when he graduated from uh, high school, drove a delivery truck for a bakery, the Richfield Bakery in town. And eventually, he and his friend John Moore, who lived on Umstead Lane, bought what is now uh, West Lane Deli and was Casimir Market for all those years. And so that was our, that was our background. No, that's interesting, because you've been talking about school. And I want to talk about your own school experience, starting as early as possible. And I think most of the people in your age group started with the little school on Bailey Avenue. It seemed to be called the Garden, and then Central. Okay, who wants to tell us first about their experience there? I, I'll go. <laughs> um, I, was, I was born right, right on Main Street. Oh, I forgot. Tell us your New Year's story. Yeah. First, 
first baby born in Richfield in 1939. That's my claim to fame. <laughs> and uh, I attended, uh, oh, that apartment where I was born is now, it's still there, but it's turned into offices. It was called a, a railroad apartment because you had the, the living room, a bedroom, a bedroom, and a kitchen, and then a hallway along all sides of the rooms with a bathroom off it. And, uh, Belonged to Judge Donnelly. I think it's still up. That's still in. That building is still in the, in the Donnelly estate. But it's, I tell you where it was. It was, uh, that apartment was over um, Rodier's Flower Shop, which just has moved in the past month, I think, across the street. But when I lived in that apartment, when I was, I lived there until I was six years old, I think. I was, as a matter of fact, I was born in that. And Dr. Woodford came out in the middle of the night and charged my father $25 for my birth, which was, uh, which in those days was a lot of money, you know, comparatively. And didn't you flunk uh, kindergarten? <laughs> yeah, uh, but first of all, over the, underneath us at that time was uh, Richfield Hardware. Ed, Ed Raymond's store was on that side of the street. If you notice, the, the old Bissell's, then it was an alleyway, then there was Ed Raven's hardware store, and we were, we lived up above it. Matter of fact, if I looked out the living room window, I looked on Main Street, there was a big sign, Dutch Boy paint sign, uh. hanging right there for the hardware store. And, uh, and, uh, and about the kindergarten, I used to walk the kindergarten from that building, because you could walk out the back, across the parking lot now, which would be by, Colby's store back there, back behind the town hall, town hall, across Bailey Avenue and in the kindergarten. So there I was, uh, five, six years old, walking to school from Main Street, which was interesting. My mother, they had uh, back porches on every one of those apartments at that time. My mother would stand up on the porch and watch me, and she could see all the way over Bailey Avenue and watch me. Well, how did you flunk? <laughs> well, when, when it got time for me to go to first grade, they told my mother I wasn't old enough. You had to be six years old by January 1st, and my birthday was January 3rd. My, my mother just blew a gasket on that. Why did they let me start kindergarten and then say you couldn't go into first grade? They must have changed the rules in midstream, you know. So she took and sent me to uh, live with my grandmother during the week in Danbury on Bob Fort Avenue. And I, I attended St. Joseph's uh, Catholic School for my first year. Okay. And uh, I just, I really just hated that whole thing. Every Sunday night I have to be carted off to Danbury and then brought back on a Friday. And I was six year old kid. I was a, I was a mess, I think. So eventually, somehow, they changed their mind and realized it wasn't a good idea. And, I, and so I got back into ritual school the next year. Okay, good. Now, Lynn, what are your memories of early education? Well, uh, I went to kindergarten. They, there, there was preschool and kindergarten on Bailey Avenue. For whatever reason, I didn't go to uh, preschool, but I did go to kindergarten. Our teacher was Miss Knapp. She was a little tiny thing. Um, and uh, then we went up to up to the old high school. And we, we started in one end of the school. And by the time we graduated from high school, we were up in the upper right-hand corner, if you're facing the building. Um, our principal was Miss O'Shea. I, and I loved school and I loved, loved my teachers. Some of the ones that, we had a lot of um, sister acts there as teachers. Um, we had the Regan sisters, we had the Bolin sisters, none of them married the, at all. The Hearst. The Hearst sisters, yep, yeah. none of them married. Um, my favorite teachers in elementary school, I would say, was my, the one that made me decide to be a teacher was Miss Mulvaney. She was my fifth grade teacher and she was just, she was just fabulous. That's what I wanted to be my, after that, my whole life after that. Um, and then in sixth grade, 
we got a young male teacher. Oh. Um, Mike Scandera, Mr. Scandera, who oh, later became a doctor. Yeah. 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 And he was great because he would do things like take our class down to the gym for extra time. And we'd use the pummel horse and you know things like that. We, we never had that stuff before. There was a lot of emphasis on learning to dance. The other sixth grade teacher, Miss Hurst, yeah, taught awesome. their students to dance. We had a dance, we had a dance card. It was, it was just, you know, we, we thought it was, it was, we just thought he was fabulous. I was Miss Hurst, I was with Miss Hurst. I didn't get Miss, Mr. Scandera. And uh, she was always had this boys dance. And of course, 12 years old, we weren't into too much into that. <laughs> but she, she thought that would not help my social graces, I guess. Right. Right. Well, let's move on uh, to high school. I know, uh, Lynn, you were very active in high school. Tell me the type well, of things that you did. Well, we only had 65 students in our senior class, so um, there was a lot of opportunity to have a lot, do a lot of activities. Uh, I was the uh, class secretary for four years, and Mr. Bolenbeck, who was one of my, everyone's favorite teachers, uh, said to me at the last class reunion he attended, because uh, I kind of spearhead a class reunion every five years. We're still doing it, if you can believe it, after all these years. Um, the last one he came to, when he came in the door, he said to me, still the secretary, you didn't realize this was going to be a lifetime position, <laughs> did you? Uh, so, uh, yeah, we had a school newspaper. We had a school magazine that came out four times a year, the Hilltopics Dispatch, and the newspaper was the Chieftain. I was just involved in any kind of activity. I was not athletic, so I was involved in any other kind of activity I could get into, student council, etc. Tell us about the music competitions. I think that's interesting. Yes. Uh, Mr. Rowe was our music teacher, and he used to write every year a musical for the school, uh, which of course everybody you know loved and wanted to be a part of. And then he, we also had a music competition where you would get a group of three or four people to sing together to the music. I can remember one year we all dressed in four of us dressed in pajamas and we sang Mr. Sandman. Oh, that, old, that was you know, Mr. Sandman. Yeah. yeah, and then you know, you'd get some kind of people would vote for you and you get some credit. But we always looked forward to that, yeah. And also in high school, we had another male teacher who was brand new to us. He, the, the way he thought, the way he, he was a lot younger, and that was Mr. Singer, Kurt Singer, who was our English teacher. And he was big on having us read the New York Times book review every week, and we'd have a little quiz on that and mm -hmm. learn about that. Uh, he was just, um, he was young, he was handsome, and he was something that we had never, with all our lady teachers, something that we really hadn't had a whole lot of before. We really loved that. Very exciting. Now, while you were singing Mr. Sandman, you <laughs> were singing the Raccoon song. Well, that, so tell us about that. That, that the competition ended up to be like a talent show right. that, it was, that we put on at night for the whole mm -hmm. town to come to to see, and then they judge for which group was the best. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was in, I sang in that one year with, with three other boys or four other boys, seniors. We didn't win. The crook, I remember the, the senior girls won. Mm -hmm. And uh, what the heck, oh, I, I uh, my, my big uh, show was I, with the Glee Club, put on a, put on a, and the orchestra would put on a, a music show once a year, right? Mm -hmm. At the Glee Club. I had a solo sang in front of the whole Glee Club behind me. And the name of the song was Raccoon Hunt. Now, <clears throat> I can't believe this. They had me bring in my uh, great grandfather's double barrel shotgun into school. And I took a, 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 a 12 gauge uh, shell and took all the BBs out of it and put it right in the gun, and after the song was over, I had to take the shotgun and go off into the eaves of the stage and fire it in school and come out waving a, a thing that looked like a raccoon that I shot. And can you imagine that today? Oh, absolutely <laughs> not. 
Matter, I still have that uh, right. little shock. Now, part. the two of you uh, both went to Ridgefield High School. You were four years older. So you didn't date in high school. Mm -hmm. So tell us about your dating life in high school because you both had serious relationships. Well, first of all, I was when I was uh, a kid, I was a paper boy. I had a paper room and, on the Embry Road. Who was one of my customers but Lynn's grandparents. And, and Lynn used to, when, she, when her mother and father would be working in the store, Lynn used to spend a lot of time with her grandparents, Koreans, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I can remember her, as I, I was probably, you know, 12 or 13, she had to be what, nine, yeah. yeah. She'd come out and pay me on Saturdays. 35 cents was what the paper cost for a week. And then that day at the Embry, the Embry News Times, a nightly paper, but no sun, an evening paper. So it was for six days, it was 35 cents. Now, who uh, did you date and what did you do on dates at that time? Well, I met, <laughs> met Lynn with uh, Tammy Sullivan and Merrick Jacobs' wedding. We were both, at, she was friends with Tammy. I knew Tammy too, but Jake was my friend. So that's where we met and we started dating. And, uh, oh, who did you date before? Oh, my high school sweetheart was uh, Judy Nash, and uh, that was Carl Nash's daughter. Right. And uh, uh, her and I ended up going to uh, UConn together. She, I was, I didn't go to to UConn the fall after I graduated, and she talked me. She was going up there, and she talked me into taking the SATs. And the fall, when I went to Hartford and took the SATs and got accepted in the spring semester of UConn. And as time goes on, it just sort of, you know, happens. You drift apart. So Judy and I never, never made it past UConn, I don't think. Now, how about you? You had another boyfriend. Uh, my, my main boyfriend in high school was named Tim Brown. I don't even remember how we met, to tell you the truth. And, it was just the last couple of years of high school. He went to Abitech and lived in Georgetown. And when I went off to college, you know, that was it. I went to college in Pennsylvania, and I think his family moved to Vermont. So that was the end of that. Now, when you were in high school, where did you meet? Where did you hang out? What did you do in your free time? Well, at the bottom of the Lounsbury House, was the teen canteen, and that was great for us because we could go there on weekends. There were ping pong tables, music, etc. Um, just a place for us kids to go go to hang out. Um, we used to take a couple trips with them. We went to, well, there was the Dick Clark show in Philadelphia, and then there was another one, Jim Somebody in New Haven, and he had a dance party type thing. And the most biggest memory I have of that is we were going. We, got, we had to be chosen, of course, because all the schools wanted to be there. We got on the bus to go, and the, the guest we knew was going to be Bobby Darin, so we were all oh. excited. Well, I don't know whether we got lost. I can't remember why we didn't get there, but by the time we got there, there was like five minutes of the show left. We never ba basically didn't hardly make it on camera, and he had already performed and left, so it was kind of a dud of a trip, but for about three hours we were excited and thought we were going to see Bobby Darren. But the Teen Canteen was wonderful because there, um, you know, we had the movie theater in town, we had bowling in Danbury, um, but it was just some place where we could always just go and hang, you know, kind of like the Boys Club is now. Uh, well, of course, right. the Boys Club is much more. Now what about you know, swimming and skating and things like that? Well, you know, um, you know where Fox, Fox Hill the condominium is at that time? That was the town skating rink. Where the, uh, <coughs> the cars along that stretch would be parked there at night, just lined right up, and all, all the town would go down there and, and, and skate. And then when, it, they, uh, when uh, Fox Hill came in and bought that and put them in the condominiums, I guess because of what? Worried about lawsuits that ended that we didn't skate there. But as a kid, I, I lived up on by the Catholic cemeteries in what was called Pia Park, and we used to walk down there during the day and skate. And I can remember 
chopping holes, I mean, chopping a hole in the ice with a hatch, and if we had four inches, it was safe to go on. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd stay off it. And uh, under that ice, it's something that I put goldfish in that pond. And in the wintertime, you could see all these uh, orange fish, maybe about 10 inches long, swimming under the ice, so it's kind of interesting. But we spent a lot of time skating down there. And as far as the boys club went, it was Mr. Crouchley. Uh, I was on uh, the basketball team, the boys club, and he used to take us in his uh, Volkswagen, uh, Vanna wagon, is that what they call it? The, Vol the Volkswagen wagon. And uh, he'd take us all, all around to uh, Danbury, uh, Reading, Newtown, and we'd play. Local. And what about football? Well, football was later on. <clears throat> But before that, um, we played. I played a lot of basketball. We got a new basketball coach called Melvin Mackowicki. And Melvin came in and, and looked over the, the, uh, the, uh, the boys' club team and he said, uh, you know, you guys are good enough to play JV now. So in one year, you know, I was playing boys' club basketball and JV high school basketball. I played basketball constantly <laughs> with the practices and everything. But later on, uh, 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 we st uh, we started, uh, I started this fo on football, and that was when we had six-man football. And I can remember our first helmets were the old leather helmets with no face. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that was, uh, that was it. Somebody in class, I think it was Ned Carboni, got all the freshman boys to go out for football that year. And uh, we, we, we played a lot, a lot of the surrounding towns, you know. But uh, after that year, I think the, there were so many of us that in my, my senior year, uh, it was such interesting football, we went and had 11 man football team. I, I played on the first 11-man football in that oh, show, which great. was, my senior year was 57, so that football team was the fall of 56, the first 11-man football team. Now you mentioned you had been a paper boy. Now you must have had other jobs in high school other than oh, being yeah. a paper boy. That, that paper route was interesting because one of my stops was uh, Joe May's restaurant and bar so here I was, you know, 12, 13, 14, every night I had to go into a bar <laughs> and deliver the paper. And I, a lot of times on Saturdays when I had to collect my 35 cents, one of the, one of the patrons would always buy me a soda. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was one of my favorite stops before I went over to Robert's Lane. It was my last bit of the room. After, after that, we, uh, and of course, we, the rite of passage in Richfield was just about every teenage boy caddied at Silver Spring. And we had, they had, they had many good times up there. Every Monday was caddies, caddies day, and they let all the caddies play on the course. And they actually kept our score, score and gave us a handicap. <coughs> and, uh, and at the end of the year, they'd have a, a Tournament and they had us flighted and everything in the first levels, different levels, and they didn't have a big uh, picnic at the Gold Academies and uh, you know, the cookout and sodas and hot dogs and stuff. And then we'd have contests, longest drive and putting and stuff. So they, they treated their the Silver Spring people, treated the caddies really well. I remember uh, one of my uh, one of the guys I caddied for was Dr. Wing. Uh, he was, uh, I think he was Chinese, but he always, the flat rate for a double A team was $3.50. Oh. And you'd get, you'd normally get a four or four fifty or five, but Dr. Wing, he was a special one. He paid us four ninety nine with a stick of gum. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great <laughs> story. <Yeah. laughs> And of course, a stick of, a stick of gum was a penny. You know, right. you, could buy a, you could buy a pack of gum for a nickel. 
Now, you told us, Jimmy, went on to UConn. Uh, tell us, Lynn, about your college education and what career path you took. I uh, went to a small girls' college in Glenside, Pennsylvania. It was called Beaver College. It's now called Arcadia University. 800 girls. I majored in elementary education and uh, graduated. I did my student teaching in Abington Township, Pennsylvania, in third grade. And after I graduated from college, I got a job working in, Ab in Abington for a year. But by then, Jim and I had started dating, so I moved home to Richfield. And um, when I came home to Richfield, they were building, I believe it was Barlow Mountain School. And all, so all the fifth grades and sixth grades were in East Ridge together. And our principal was Doug Smith. And um, then the next year, Barlow opened, and everybody went back to their normal elementary schools. And I went to Veterans Park School where my principal was Joe Laney, and I taught sixth grade. Um, then I left to have my children, and so I was not working for like 15 years, because they're all about, the three of them are about five years apart. And right before I was getting back, ready to go back to teaching, I knew I was gonna have to start on my master's. I took a couple of courses at Westcon, but a friend of mine was leaving a job for a marketing company on Grove Street in Richfield. It was called TMP, Telephone Marketing. And what we did, what they did, was uh, Yellow Pages advertising, if you can believe, like anybody even looks at a Yellow Pages book anymore. But, um, so I, she said, you wanna, you know, I need, I'm leaving, I need somebody to, so I said, oh, you know, what the heck, I never went up to work in an office, but I'll give it a try. So I did, and, Yes, 25 years later, I retired from that business. So. <laughs> no, that's great. Now, uh, Jim, uh, how about cars? I think cars are important to you, and I know your women friends are very important to you, <laughs> and I want to talk about that, so tell me about your love of cars. Well, my first, my first car um, I bought from my, uh, my savings is a uh, working in the AMP, and that's what cost me $65. It was a 35 Ford Coupe with a rumble seat. Beautiful car, I wish I had that car today. But I bought it off Otto Pambi Yankee, and the Pambi Yankee's Bodge, and uh, it had a growling rear end. So my friend Jackie Sullivan had a, had a 35 Ford convertible that he used to drive around the fields behind his house and he blew the engine or something. So here I was, 17 years old, out in the back of his house in the field. I, I took the rear end out of that car and brought it up to Walt Scott, who had a, a, mechan a mechanics business up on North Street. And uh, Walt went fishing on a Saturday, and he let me use his garage. And I, I took the rear end out of my 35 Ford and put the one in from Jackie's right in this car. And what, I had more fun with that car with the rumble seat. The back window would, would roll down so you could talk to the people in the back. <laughs> Very uh, unique. And it had, it had mechanical brakes. It had a, a 19, this is a 35 Ford, and a 1940 Firestone radio, the old two, and it hung underneath. And it was fine. It would play well as long as the engine wasn't running. As soon as you started the engine, yeah, I picked up all the static from the spark. That's a great. Uh, Lynn, I, I'm just so impressed by the women in town who have stayed together since elementary school. Some are here, some have moved. Tell us about how this relationship continues. Well, as I said before, there were, our classes were so small, and uh, we, we, most, my friends, my best friends, my closest friends, my biggest support group, I would say, are, there are about nine of us, and five of us are still in the area, and the others live in Georgia, South Carolina, California. Um, we have stayed close all these years, seen each other through a lot of stuff, like you do. Yeah. 
we've traveled together. We've gone to Charleston, South Carolina. We've gone to Rhode Island a couple of times. And it's just something that's so special. We pick up, if we haven't seen each other in years, we can still pick up with a bottle of wine. And it's just like we never have been apart. It's yeah. really important. important part of all our lives, I think. Yeah. Yeah, see you all together. It's like your sister. Yeah. I mean, you're so close. Um, I want you to think about if there's anything else, but one thing we didn't hit on, we talked about, the fireman's ball in town. And then you want to tell us about that and then your impression. Well, that, that was just, a, a, for us as dating and young marriage, that was the biggest event of the year. Um, they would be on, what, on the tennis court, right? No, they, 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 they set up the tent when they in the baseball oh, field. Oh, the baseball field. And they the build a dance club. They put a dance club for mm -hmm. But they'd have a big name band, if I remember, too, like Tommy Dwarfs. I mean, just, it was what everybody looked forward to, you know, the every time, year. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. It sounds like such a great oh, community gosh. event. Yeah. And, you know, Jim, just tell us very briefly, I, how many kids did you have? What are they doing? And how many grandkids? Why don't you do that? Oh. <laughs> uh, we have three children. Our oldest son graduated from Westcon, and he's a cardiovascular drug rep with Bernard um, Engelheim. Our daughter, Amy, lives in Boston. She graduated from the University of Delaware, and she is the development manager with uh, a nonprofit. She's always worked nonprofits called the Marine Forests Alliance, and uh, our youngest son Mike works for Federated Insurance. He's what they call a risk control coordinator. He checks out propane companies and everything that and makes sure they're up to code when they're insuring them. And we have five grandchildren. Um, uh, let's see, two boys, two. Two boys and three girls. That's it. Okay, so just in conclusion, you've lived in Ridgefield all your life. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've considered moving or not, but what is there about Ridgefield? If you had to talk to somebody who had never been here, what should they know about this town? Okay, why don't you go, Jim? Well, th this town that we now is not like the town we moved up when we were kids, it was uh, 4,000 was back then. Now yeah. there's 25,000. I mean, and it, it's just uh, it's just grown so much that you can't even come down Main Street anymore and all the side with the traffic. We never saw anything like that. My grandmother lived, as I said, right down the road here about a quarter mile. And I remember as a kid sitting on, if I, about, she was babysitting for me, sitting on her front porch, she sitting in the rocker. And we'd sit and walk, wait for a car to go by on, on West Lane, and we'd have to sit there about 10 minutes before, before a car would go by. And, and she said, okay, that one's yours. And then we wait another 10 minutes, and she said, okay, this one's mine. And across the street was a big estate, and there would be your cows grazing in the pasture. So I guess what I'm trying to, it was just a, a, different, a different world than it is nowadays. How about you, Lynn? Well, um, I, you know, I have I have a friend who um, who said who grew up here, and I'm still very close to not part of the group I was talking about. But she will say every once in a while she lives near a city. You know, really, you we lived in a bubble, you know, and it, but it was a great bubble, and um, I think why we've never moved. Uh, though there have been a couple of times we were thinking about it. For me, it's to be close to family. So many of my friends have their children living all over the United States, and ours are all within a three hour. And of course, my friends, and it's just, um, it, it's different, but you know, it's still Richfield. I don't, you know, I don't know how to describe that other than that. I love that bubble analogy. Yeah. I mean, that really says it all. Well, and right. I, Yep, go ahead. Well, one, uh, there was a time that uh, we purchased a lot down in uh, North Carolina on a golf community with our plans to move there and uh, build a house and move on this uh, 
at 27 hole golf course that all you know tenants and all the amenities. But Lynn couldn't leave her girlfriend. <laughs> So and her family. She couldn't leave her family. Died at the wall of Ridgefield. <laughs> well, I want to thank both of you. You are a delightful couple. You had so many great stories to share. I think you really gave a unique overview of the I, town. I could, I could sit here probably for a couple of hours <laughs> telling you, as memories keep coming back, about what Ridgefield is like. One of the things I just remember is that there was a lot of characters in town, and everybody had a nickname. There was Musky, there was Snakey, there was Bones for Carboni. And of course, uh, my last name being Mullen, it was a comic strip, I remember Moon Mullins, the comic? I was Moon. And it, it was just a, a different world. I could, you know, I could talk, tell stories. Yeah. You right. certainly can. I, and I never even got into my uh, army experience. Oh, <laughs> oh we'll say that for, for the next yeah. time. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much, and I want to thank all of the viewers for tuning in. I hope you enjoy this program. I certainly do. I want to learn about Ridgefield. I hope you want to learn about Ridgefield as well. And if you grew up in Ridgefield, let us know. And we'll put you on camera and you can tell your story. Thank you so much and goodbye.